Hey guys, today I'll show you a fantasy horror TV series named Siren, Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in the stormy Bering Strait, where several fishermen were hastily collecting their nets, pulling the ropes with great strength to spill a bounty of sea fish onto the deck. At that moment, they discovered a large creature moving among the fish, as several were flung aside. Seized by panic, they each armed themselves with harpoons and axes, visibly tense in the face of the unknown. They cautiously approached to take a closer look when the creature suddenly revealed itself, lashing out with its tail and sending one man flying like a Barbie toy. The others, brandishing their long harpoons, quickly surrounded it, driving the creature into the cabin, where they all breathed a sigh of relief. However, the attacked man, Chris, was seriously injured, prompting the captain to call for medical evacuation. After the storm, there was an eerie singing coming from the calm sea surface, emanating from the fishing boat's cabin, drawing those who heard it uncontrollably towards it. As one was about to open the hatch, a helicopter arrived overhead with a team of Navy SEALs descending. The team leader approached and demanded to see what they had caught that night. The captain retorted that his catch was none of their concern and that their presence was solely for the injured crew member. The team leader, with contempt, acknowledged the need for the injured Chris, promptly taking him away. Then, the leader opened the cabin, looked at the unknown creature without surprise, and had it tranquilized, packed into a metal box and evacuated. Meanwhile, not far from the fishing boat, a mysterious tale surfaced. This is the town of Bristol Cove, known for its mermaid legends. In a local bar, the fishermen met their good friend, Ben, who is a biologist. They eagerly shared their harrowing experience, hoping Ben's knowledge could help. They spoke of the unknown creature from the sea and the crew member Chris, who got bitten and was airlifted by the seals. But the Coast Guard had no record of such an evacuation. It was as if Chris had vanished. Curious, Ben asked if none of them had clearly seen what attacked them. With a meaningful glance at a mermaid statue, the man hinted at their attacker. They showed him the video footage on their phone, but Ben, a man of science, was skeptical of mermaid tales. The scene shifts to a hidden military base somewhere else, where an enormous aquarium held a mysterious creature with the tail of a fish and the upper body of a human. Its strange appearance convinced onlookers that it was the mermaid of legend. The next day, while Ben was sunbathing near the beach, he encountered the man who had shared the incredible tale, now angry at not being believed. Ben said he would believe it when he saw it for himself. At that moment, a young boy in the sea was bumped by something, and nervously looking into the water, he saw a shark, which made him cry out for help. But it turns out the shark was already dead. Ben observed the shark with only a head and pondered. He and his girlfriend went to study the shark's wounds, concluding that they were not caused by a fight with another shark, but by a larger predator. Wondering about the size of the creature capable of inflicting such damage, Ben was driving back when suddenly a naked girl appeared in front of his car. Fortunately, he braked in time to avoid a tragedy. The girl tried to leave, stumbling, apparently unfamiliar with walking. Ben got out to see if she needed help, but actually wanted to peep at her naked body. However, the girl didn't respond and fainted. Ben quickly wrapped her naked body in his coat, placed her in his car, and called for medical help. He took the girl home where she woke up on the sofa, examining her new surroundings with wonder. Ben attempted to communicate, but she just stared back in amazement without speaking. When Ben awkwardly reached for a teacup, the girl began to hum a song that seemed to have the power to bewitch and ensnare the mind. Their moment was interrupted by an urgent knock at the door. It was the doctor coming to check on the girl. But as Ben went to answer the door, the girl had already escaped through the window. She hid in an abandoned boat for the night and upon waking, played with her stinky feet. She caught a rat without hesitation and after breakfast, dressed in a hoodie and took to the streets, seemingly in search of something. She passed a boutique and curiously watched the cleaning lady inside, who looked back in shock and disbelief. Ben came to look for the girl and witnessed this scene. By the time he approached, the girl had vanished. He questioned the cleaning lady named Helen, who claimed not to have seen her, keeping silent about the girl's presence as if harboring a secret. The girl followed a scent to the beach, where she found the North Star fishing boat and discovered a net similar to the one that had taken her mermaid sister from the deep sea the day before. She had come ashore to find her sister, who had been captured by fishermen, as shown previously. Unfamiliar with the human world, she picked up a helicopter model, recognizing it as the device that had taken her sister. Imitating a cartoon character, she named herself Rin. 
As she didn't speak the human language, she used the helicopter model to signal a dirty man nearby for help in finding her sister. Clumsily, she got into the passenger seat of his car. Innocent Rin was unaware of the dirty man's dirty intentions. He drove to a secluded area and began to make advances on her, but in an instant, the dirty man's dirty body was violently thrown out of the car. Afterwards, Rin peeled off her blood-stained jacket. By now, the mermaid, having been ashore too long, had started to dehydrate and shed her skin. She needed to hasten her search for her sister, or she'd eventually dry out completely. Just then, she noticed a symbol on a nearby house that matched the one on her clothing exactly. It read, Bristol Cove Marine Research Center. Rin followed the path and dashed into the Marine Research Center, where she found a large bottle of fish smoothie on a table inside. She grabbed it and guzzled it down. Satiated, Rin walked out contentedly, only to disturb a performing sea lion, which immediately became restless and agitated. The sea lions began to roar at Rin, prompting the staff to evacuate the children for fear of the animals losing control and causing harm. At that moment, Ben, who worked at the Marine Institute, encountered Rin again. Seeing Ben approach, Rin was startled and ran back inside, warning him in her own way not to come any closer. Ben carefully calmed the panicked Rin, saying he wouldn't hurt her and he could help her. With that, he slowly squatted down, and seeing that he meant no harm, Rin began to relax. Ben introduced himself, and Rin responded. When Ben saw that she could speak, he tentatively asked her where she was from. However, the dehydrated Rin started coughing. Ben noticed something was amiss with her health and gestured to take a look. He told her that they had medicine here that should be able to help her, gently stroking Rin's peeling arm. Then, he added the night they met, she sang a unique song and he couldn't forget it. Just then, Ben's girlfriend, Maddie, walked in, nearly misunderstanding the situation. Rin coughed again, and Ben mentioned he was about to call a doctor to have a look at her. Since his girlfriend had a class, she generously suggested that Ben stay to take care of the strange girl. After a kiss, she left. Rin had seen this exchange and understood the kindness. Ben assured Rin he would find a doctor and she could rest easy there. With that, he walked away, but no doctor came by nightfall. Rin's condition worsened, her breathing grew more labored, and with her last bit of strength, she crawled to the seaside and plunged in. Once back in the sea, Rin quickly shed her clothes. The sea lions became even more terrified and roared like a goose alarmingly. The noise alerted Ben, who headed to the control room. In her agony, Rin's mouth sprouted sharp teeth, her palms developed webbing, her back grew fins, and her legs fused into a large fishtail. It was hard to believe that the girl had transformed into a beautiful mermaid in the blink of an eye, and the entire metamorphosis was captured clearly by the underwater surveillance. Ben was incredibly surprised. He hadn't expected the strange girl he met to be the legendary mermaid of myths. He ran out the door and dove into the water, eager to see the transformed girl for himself. Perhaps he was also hoping for a heartfelt embrace, like in the fairy tales. Shining his flashlight into the water, he got a clear view of Rin beneath the surface. Now transformed into a mermaid, Rin had become aggressive and unpredictable. She mistook Ben for prey and attacked him. Rin charged at Ben, and they began to struggle in the water. Rin bit Ben, wounding him, but he managed to break free and kick her heavy body away. Taking advantage of the moment, Ben quickly swam to the surface. Just as he was about to climb onto the shore, Rin caught hold of his leg. In the nick of time, Ben grabbed a harpoon and knocked Rin unconscious with it, finally escaping the water's grasp. When Rin came to, she did not pursue him further, but instead swam back to the depths, tail flicking behind her. Ben, still shaken, braved the rain to reach Helen's convenience store. He pounded on the doors and windows frantically. He had too many questions that needed answers. When he saw Helen come out, he challenged her that he knew she saw the strange girl yesterday and she must know a lot about her. Helen opened the door to let him in, but wasn't sure what he knew. Ben excitedly added that he had seen the girl transform in the water. He picked up a mermaid storybook from nearby, as if discovering a new continent, and grew more excited as he thought these mermaid tales are not just fairy tales, they're real events. He asked the woman why she was suddenly so afraid. Helen pointed at Ben's wound and asked if the strange girl did that to him. She then revealed that long ago, mermaids were an extremely gentle species, until Ben's grandfather and his crew began a brutal hunt that nearly drove these beautiful creatures to extinction. The surviving mermaids became vicious and bloodthirsty. That's why Rin attacked him after transforming. Ben was utterly shocked by the revelation. His family held such a dark history, and it filled him with shame. 
The next day, the fisherman Xander was preparing to go to sea, intending to catch another mermaid to prove that they weren't just a legend. Ben went to the seaside to meet him, insisting on going along, partly out of concern that they might harm the mermaids. The night at sea was cold, but they weren't sleepy at all. Suddenly, the detector gave a signal, and they watched from the deck. A huge splash erupted from the sea in front of them. The captain aimed his harpoon gun, but Ben intervened, causing the shot to go astray. While they were arguing, a mermaid's scream echoed from the water's surface. They thought they had injured the mermaid with their misfired harpoon. Ben stripped off his coat and plunged into the sea. In the freezing water, with a flashlight in hand, he searched for the mermaid. Following the sound, he found a sonar-like device stuck to the boat's propeller, emitting the mermaid's screams. He removed the device and brought it back to the ship for examination. The crew suggested it might be a Doppler current profiler, used by oceanographers to study water flow patterns. It turned out that the military, having taken mermaids for experiments, needed more subjects. Therefore, they used recorded mermaid screams to lure more of their kind into a trap. On the other side, Rin transformed back into a human form and came ashore to continue her search for her sister, who had been taken away by the military. The girl shed her mermaid skin by the sea and walked naked on the streets, leaving a little girl who saw her dumbfounded. The mother told her daughter to look away and quickly ushered her inside the house. Rin approached clothes hanging out to dry, picked out a dress she liked, and was about to put on some trousers when she was discovered by the owner of the clothes. As the woman approached, cursing and getting closer, Rin picked up a piece of rebar from the ground and threw it with force, piercing a pillar next to the woman. The woman realized she was no match for Rin and could only watch helplessly as Rin left, forgetting to charge for the clothes. Rin planned to ask Ben for help in finding her sister, but when she arrived at Ben's house, it was empty. She saw a picture of Ben with his girlfriend on the table and remembered Ben's workplace, the Marine Research Institute. However, Ben was not there either. Following Ben's scent, Rin arrived at Helen's convenience store. When Helen saw her come in, she quickly sent the customers away, closed the store, and cautiously asked Rin what she was doing there. Before Helen could take a step forward, Rin, on her guard, warned her not to come closer. Rin tried to communicate her intentions to Helen without using language, looking for something around that could convey her message. She picked up a ceramic mermaid figurine and forcefully broke it in two, using one half to represent herself and the other to symbolize her missing sister. After guessing Rin's intent, Helen temporarily took her in, found her some proper clothes, and told her she would go out to buy some food that Rin could eat to satisfy her hunger before they went in search of her sister. Meanwhile, a bald henchman of a military lab was placing an order with a doctor here. He needed 30 milliliters of spinal fluid from a mermaid and six tissue core samples from the upper thoracic cavity. As he spoke, the mermaid in the pool furiously slapped the water with her tail, trying to plead with them to let her go, but she thought better of it, perhaps because the bald henchman was too bald and too ugly. Elsewhere, Ben returned to the Marine Research Center and was about to get cozy with his girlfriend when she noticed the wound on the back of his neck. He told Maddie everything about discovering the mermaid, and although it was hard to believe without the transformation surveillance footage, their priority now was to protect Rin from being captured by the military for experiments. So they took the device they had brought back from the sea and went to the convenience store to find Helen. They arrived just as Helen was returning from outside, but she tried to hide the fact that Rin was there and attempted to send them away. Ben didn't care about Helen's attitude. He quickly placed the device on the table, eager to confirm with Helen what the sounds were. He turned on the audio, and the mermaid's screams filled the room. Hearing the sound, Rin was overwhelmed with sadness and anger. It was her sister's scream. She felt her sister's pain in the screams and flipped the table in a fit of emotion. Helen hurriedly told Ben to turn off the device. At that moment, Rin burst out of the door, grabbed the device from Ben's hand, mistakenly thinking her sister was trapped inside it. Helen explained to her that it was just a recording, and it was not until Ben cautiously approached and switched it off that the sound stopped. Still concerned for her sister's well-being, Rin wanted to see clearly, but when the seawater from inside flowed onto her arm, she was instantly in agony, as scales began to form on her skin and began to appear on her arm. It turned out, once she came into contact with seawater, her body instinctively began to transform. Fortunately, there was only a little seawater on her skin, and Rin's arm quickly returned to normal. Ben watched Rin, his protective instincts triggered by her helpless gaze. He assured her that he would definitely help her find her sister. Although his intentions were good, her sister had been taken by the military. In such a vast world, how could they possibly find them? 
Their only hope seemed to rest with Xander because he was determined to find the companion who had been taken away by the military that night. They were counting on him to remember any details he might have overlooked about the night Rin's sister was taken. Anxious, Rin picked up the device and headed off to find Xander. Meanwhile, ever since making eye contact with the mermaid, the bald henchman began to feel pity for her. He started to apologize, and the mermaid seized the opportunity to use her bewitching power. She sang the siren song to the bald man, who became uncontrollably attracted to her despite his baldness. The scene shifts to the dirty man Rin had abandoned in the wilderness. The police had already started investigating the scene, unable to figure out what kind of assailant could throw a strong man through a windshield. At a loss, the sheriff discovered several footprints. Following the tracks, they found a blood-stained jacket. Using these clues, the sheriff located the owner of the clothes near the scene and asked the nearby residents for information. Coincidentally, the owner came out at that moment. The woman said she wanted to report a crime. A vagrant girl had been stealing clothes from her laundry line. She had taken her daughter's sports shirt and a t-shirt that morning. When she had just reprimanded the girl, she nearly got her head pierced by a steel rod. The sheriff recalled the sports shirt was the blood-stained one from the crime scene. He quickly inquired what the girl looked like. On the other side, Ben and his group were driving to find Xander. Rin was looking curiously at every sight outside the car. Upon reaching their destination, Rin saw Ben get out of the car and wanted to follow. However, Ben and Maddie were worried that too many people talking could blow their cover. No matter how Ben explained it, Rin couldn't understand why she wasn't allowed to go and became quite agitated. Maddie decided to stay behind with her, saying they would go find her sister together. This seemed to calm Rin down immediately. Still, Ben was worried. He didn't know when Rin might transform and attack them. Reluctantly, Ben agreed to let the two of them stay in the car while he met with Xander. As soon as Ben left, Rin fixed her large, fish-like eyes on Maddie and suddenly grabbed her hair. Rin sniffed her scent closely and curiously touched the feather tattoo on her chest. Maddie explained that it was a raven's feather and her father is from the Haida tribe who always say the raven is the creator of all things. She emphasized that it's just a story, though. Seeing that Rin had no intention of attacking, Maddie finally settled. Meanwhile, Ben was with Xander, who recalled all the details of the night the military came and took away the mermaid and their crew member. Xander mentioned the device they pulled from the sea, thinking it was the military who had bugged their apartment and taken the device from their home. Ben awkwardly admitted that it wasn't the military because it's him who took it. Xander was furious, as that was the only clue to finding Chris. Therefore, Ben agreed to return the device to Xander. But Rin, thinking her sister was inside the device, refused to let go. When Ben explained that only by giving it to Xander could they find the clues to locate her missing sister, Rin reluctantly let go. After returning Rin, Ben and Maddie went back to Maddie's place and sent an email to a military friend, inquiring about mermaids. As Maddie flipped through a book about mermaids, she mentioned Rin has a certain quality that's hard to explain. It's like she was drawn to her. Ben admitted that he felt the same. At that moment, Maddie's father returned from work. He was the sheriff investigating the dirty man's case. On the phone discussing the case with a subordinate, a single remark made them alert. The subordinate suggested the bloodstains could be from an animal. Out of a need for confidentiality in the case, the sheriff instinctively closed the file. Maddie glanced at Ben, and they exchanged a meaningful look, knowing that it had to be Rin's doing. Meanwhile, Rin had returned. Helen was already asleep. Rin was shocked to find information about her species in a book, so she picked up a dagger that was on the table and drew it out. As for what she did next, that hasn't been explained here yet. The next day, Rin was watching cartoons when Helen came out, turned off the TV, and questioned her about where she had been the night before. But Rin ignored her. Cut to a new scene where the bald henchman was experimenting with spinal fluid extracted from the mermaid. He mixed mermaid DNA with human DNA and injected it into a disabled lab mouse. Incredibly, the mouse fully recovered and seemed even healthier. This astonishing discovery thrilled them. If this research could be turned into medicine for humans, it would be a significant breakthrough in medical science. The bald henchman immediately arranged for his subordinates to prepare injections for the fishermen. The seriously injured fisherman Chris was brought back by the military and treated like lab mice. Having been there for so long without treatment, Chris decided to escape the research base. He stole a nurse's phone and sent a message to his companions. When Xander received Chris's distress message, he immediately told Ben. Ben planned to join them in the investigation. When Rin learned that Xander had a lead, she immediately wanted to go find her sister. Maddie stopped her. 
Maddie wanted to confirm whether it was Rin who had killed the dirty man. Facing Maddie's repeated obstruction, Rin grew impatient and threw Maddie's heavy body out. Seeing this, Ben quickly went to help his girlfriend up, tenderly reprimanded Rin for her behaving like a mad cow. However, Helen seemed to take pleasure in the misfortune. At that moment, Xander located the phone's owner, a nurse, and her home address. They immediately drove to the address. They decided it would be better to wait outside for her to come out, rather than to risk startling her. Just as they expected, the nurse left her home and got into her car. They believed that by following the nurse, they could find the place where their friend Chris was being held. They trailed the nurse's car to a secret base. Just as they attempted to follow her in, two armed soldiers rushed out, scaring them into a hasty retreat. The scene shifts to the sheriff, where the details of the case are gradually coming to light. The female officer has analyzed that the blood on the garment is indeed that of the victim. By now, based on the description provided by witnesses, the perpetrator who stole the clothes has been sketched by the owner. The next step is to commence the arrest. Meanwhile, completely unaware, Ben and the group feel the need to delve deeper into understanding Rin. Their curiosity stems from their personal interest in marine biology, and Rin represents a new, unidentified species to them. They document their study with cameras, curious as to why she would attack underwater. Rin explains that under the water they are warriors, where it's kill or be killed. Ben shows Rin 25 different patterns, then scrambles the order. Astonishingly, Rin is able to reorder them correctly, demonstrating intelligence and memory far surpassing that of humans. They proceed with a physical test on Rin. Despite her petite frame, she weighs almost 200 pounds, has an extraordinarily rapid heartbeat, and her bone density is remarkably high. However, it isn't long before Rin begins to show symptoms of dehydration and skin peeling. They know that once these symptoms start, she can only survive for one day at most. Then, a sudden appearance by the aquarium's caretaker, who spots the beautiful newcomer and strikes up a conversation, invites Rin to his wild party. In the time it takes Ben to answer a phone call, Rin leaves with the stranger. They're extremely anxious because Rin once killed a man who played dirty on her, and they fear she might cause another incident here. After much effort, they finally locate Rin, but Rin has been accidentally knocked into a swimming pool. This is disastrous. If the girl comes into contact with seawater, she will transform into a terrifying creature. The two panicked by that sight, but in a stroke of luck, the pool is not filled with seawater. As the police arrive at the scene to conduct searches, Maddie quickly hides Rin. The sheriff comes over, asking if anyone has seen the person in a photo. Ben, anticipating the sheriff's investigation might lead to Rin, calmly tells a lie. He only wants to protect Rin, help her find her sister, and ensure their safe departure. Unbeknownst to them, Rin's mermaid sister is being subjected to the extraction of large amounts of spinal fluid for detailed drug research. The mermaid, unable to bear the suffering, uses her singing to influence the bald henchman, instilling in him a protective instinct. As a result, he secretly reduces the dosage of sedatives added to her water. When they proceed with their usual fluid extraction, the mermaid breaks free from their restraints, and the scene quickly turns grisly. A short-lived worker is flung aside, crashing into nearby electronic equipment, causing a short circuit in all the facilities. The darkness provides the mermaid with a hunting environment, and soon after, screams echo throughout the entire laboratory. The injured Chris was locked up in the same facility. Sedated and jarred awake by the sounding alarms, he seized the chaotic moment. Hurriedly, he removed the needles embedded in his skin and dashed out of the ward. Just as reinforcements arrived, the mermaid had incapacitated everyone in the lab, shed her tail to take human form, and encountered the nurse. She abducted her and donned the nurse's uniform. Chris hadn't realized that the woman before him was the mermaid in disguise and was pulled along in a desperate escape. Spotting an oncoming car, they quickly hid behind it, knowing they needed to flee quickly or risk capture. Chris retrieved the nurse's car keys from her pocket and used the ID card concealed in the uniform to make a successful getaway through the main gate. Meanwhile, Xander was unaware that Chris had escaped, waiting outside the nurse's house, hoping to get some clear answers. Ben, having just taken a shower, was preparing for an intimate moment with his girlfriend, unaware that Rin was observing their live romance, startling them. Not being in seawater for several days, Rin was enduring a level of dehydration far worse than before, where she'd only lasted a day. It seemed she could now survive longer on land. Xander called, urging them to come and discuss a plan of action. However, their destination was inland, and without the sea, Rin risked becoming fish jerky on land. So they left Rin with Helen. 
Maddie voiced the question everyone had been pondering. Why couldn't Rin just return to the sea and then come back? But Rin's transformation wasn't just external. It involved breaking every bone to accommodate the mutation, causing her immense pain with each change, even though it allowed her progressively longer stays on land. So they drove to meet Xander at the agreed location. The nurse hadn't returned home for over a day and a night, prompting the group to sneak in and investigate. As they entered, a car arrived with several men who started towards the cabin. Ben and his group hurriedly fled through the back door and hid. Although they were unaware that the mermaid and Chris had already escaped from the research facility, they surmised that these men were likely there to destroy any evidence of the lab's existence. Meanwhile, the bald henchman returned to the base and saw the mermaid's discarded tail. He touched it, and it disintegrated into ash. Viewing the surveillance footage, he witnessed the entire incident unfold. However, the mermaid had vanished into the darkness. He instructed the staff to search for her using other surveillance and was astonished to see her walking on two legs. The bald henchman realized that while they thought they were studying the mermaid, she was actually studying them. Chris, who had been driving all night, discovered a cell phone in the nurse's uniform's pocket but found it had no signal. On the other side, Helen was giving Rin a milk spa. According to her, this ancient family remedy smeared on the skin could provide relief. The mischievous Rin licked a bit of it and discovered that Helen was also shedding her skin. It turned out Helen was of the same kind, which explained why she could recognize Rin's identity at a glance. But before long, Rin's condition worsened, and Helen had no choice but to call Ben for help. Ben felt that staying put would achieve nothing, so he decided to return and help Rin. They took her back to the marine research facility, and Rin's physical condition had reached its limit. Whether or not she found her sister, she had to return to the sea this time. Ben took out a necklace with a tracker and put it on her, ensuring they could always know her whereabouts to some extent and protect her safety. At that moment, having learned that Chris had been found, Ben and Maddie decided to take Rin with them. Rin's mermaid sister Donna, who had just transformed into a human, found the car's stereo system fascinating, wondering how sound could come from it. In the next second, she was frightened by the heavy metal music that made her head buzz. She pulled out a screwdriver, and Chris was terrified, thinking she was going to stab herself. Instead, she smashed the stereo. The injured Chris couldn't hold on much longer. He finally got through to Xander's phone and arranged to meet at Libby Beach. Xander relayed the news of finding Chris to Ben. When Ben arrived at the agreed location first, Rin was struggling with every breath. A car drove by slowly, and Ben recognized it as Chris's. He and Maddie hurriedly got out of the car and chased after it. Chris's wounds had burst open, and he was in danger of dying from blood loss. Xander arrived later and wanted to take his friend to the hospital, but Chris refused firmly, fearing the military might find him again. So they took him to a private clinic for treatment. Meanwhile, the dying Rin in the car also saw her long-lost sister. She tried to make a sound to let Donna know she was there, but no sound came out. In desperation, Rin pushed open the car door and staggered after her. She forced herself to follow her to the beach, using all her strength to scream in a fish voice, hoping her sister would turn back to look. Rin finally reunited with her sister, who tenderly picked her up, and they returned to the sea together. All of this was witnessed by Ben and Maddie, their eyes filled with reluctance and helplessness. Afterward, they came to a familiar private clinic in the small town, where the doctor, puzzled, noted that everyone knew Chris had disappeared. And yet, with his severe injuries, they hadn't taken him to the hospital. Ben explained that Chris had been through a lot and pleaded with the doctor to save him, promising their gratitude. Moved by Ben's sincere plea, the doctor agreed to treat Chris. They took turns caring for him throughout the night, and as they did, the TV broadcast news of a fire at the exact location of the secret lab. This was no accident. The military intended to move the location of their experiments. Xander feared they might come for Chris, and he was right to worry. The bald henchman had found the vehicle Chris had abandoned by the roadside and was searching it for clues. At this time, Rin and Donna had returned to the deep sea. They missed Rin and tracked her with a locator, but the signal vanished suddenly, causing Ben to be devastated. A month passed, and Ben would still often sail alone to the area where Rin's signal had disappeared, hoping to encounter her again. This left his girlfriend Maddie feeling neglected after all this time. Just when they were about to seriously make up for their lost romance, an emergency occurred again unexpectedly. The locator started beeping, showing that Rin had returned. Following the signal to the shore, they found two shed mermaid tails that crumbled to sand at their touch. The signal showed Rin had run into a nearby forest. Ben immediately chased after the signal, and as he neared the target, he found only the dropped locator. 
Just moments before, Rin and Donna had crossed the forest towards the sports field. Rin picked up clothes from a rack and tossed them to her sister, gesturing for her to put them on, while she donned another piece for herself. Donna was furious because humans had captured and tormented her, yet her sister Rin was carrying the locator they had installed. In a rage, she pulled it off and threw it away. But in Rin's eyes, some humans were good. Meanwhile, Ben suspected that Rin would go to the Marine Research Center looking for him. They quickly drove back, and upon entering, they were greeted by Rin. In a show of affection, Rin warmly embraced the two of them. Her sister, however, could not comprehend this behavior. Rin introduced her sister to Ben and Maddie, but Donna remained highly vigilant towards them. Rin explained that they needed help because overfishing by fishermen meant there was no food left to catch in their home waters, leaving them starving. At that moment, Donna noticed a small fish being dissected for research nearby and in a rage, mistakenly thought that the two humans had taken their food. She lost control of her anger and hurled a basin at Ben. As Ben tried to explain, Donna grabbed him by the neck and lifted him up like a Barbie toy. Rin hurried to intervene. The sister's scuffle was deadly in every move. Ben quickly grabbed a flare to separate them and it worked. Donna reached out for Rin, wanting her to return to the sea with her. But Rin knew that her family faced starvation and that only humans could help. Moreover, the people she trusted the most were behind her, so she chose to stay. Feeling betrayed, Donna left alone and followed a scent to a large seafood warehouse. She broke into a box of frozen fish and started devouring them. She was discovered by a worker driving a forklift. As the man prepared to get off and shoo her away, Donna turned and gave him such a fright that he recoiled back into the vehicle and tried to flee the scene. Donna then leapt onto the forklift and throttled the man, both tumbling into a pile of tires. The man took the opportunity to stand up and hit the nearby alarm. The urgent alarm blared through the warehouse, sending Donna into a panicked flight. Rin knew her sister wouldn't return to the sea alone and was worried that Donna might wander off and get caught by bad people again. So Ben arranged for Helen, who was most familiar with mermaid habits, to search for Donna. Meanwhile, Ben went to the dock to inquire about the recent catch volumes of the fishermen, hoping to find some clues. There, he encountered his father, dealing with an incident. The father revealed that a strange girl had sneaked into the warehouse at night to eat the raw fish and had beaten up one of his employees. Ben immediately guessed who it was. After his father left, Ben learned from a worker that just a month ago, a new buyer had arrived at the dock. Whether it was big fish, small fish, or dead fish, they'd buy it all, no matter the quantity. At the same time, the government had relaxed its fishing policies. Driven by profit, the fishermen naturally fished without restraint. But no one knew where these fish were being sold after being bought up. It turned out that all of this was a military conspiracy. The military had made significant medical advances with Donna, and now they needed a large number of mermaids for experiments. So, they had the government stop regulating the fishermen and even increase the purchase of aquatic products. Their plan was to deplete the food supply needed by the mermaids, then lure the starving mermaids with bait to capture them all in one fell swoop. After the lesson of their lab being bloodied by a mermaid, they redesigned and developed a fully enclosed aquarium. This system was designed to release tranquilizers at regular intervals from below. Because the bald henchman had been enchanted by Donna's siren song, he did not report to the military that he had tracked Donna down to this seaside town. Rin was learning human social customs. She saw Maddie hold her hand to comfort her and did the same. She witnessed couples saying goodbye with a kiss and awkwardly tried it herself. At this time, Helen had already found Donna and gained her trust. After all, they were of the same kind and easier to communicate with. Maddie brought Rin to meet her sister. The sisters met with a tense atmosphere, but Rin had no intention of starting another conflict. She apologized to Donna in the mermaid way, and Donna gladly accepted. Helen was about to make tea so they could all sit down and chat, but the mermaid sisters sent her out. Donna saw right through her sister's thoughts, asking if Rin had fallen for a human. She reminded Rin that the mermaids must eventually return to the sea, adding that the humans only tied her up, drew her blood, cut her flesh, and inflicted endless harm upon her. She warned Rin not to trust the humans. Rin knew of her sister's suffering and felt deeply sorry for her. Originally, it was Rin who had led her sister to the surface to feed, which resulted in her being captured, and she felt a great deal of guilt for this. On the other side, Ben encountered the bald henchman at the charity dinner hosted by his parents. 
The bald man spoke to Ben's mother, who was seated in a wheelchair, about a rare marine creature he had recently discovered. He was studying its stem cells, which evidently had astonishing capabilities. Ben was eager to change the subject, but his handicapped mother was very interested in this research. The bald henchman explained that he injected the genes of a deep-sea creature into a group of paralyzed mice, and amazingly, each mouse regained its ability to move. Ben's mother was thrilled by the news, nurturing a hope that she could be treated with these stem cells. The bald man then proposed that if Ben could help him find Donna, he would offer his research to Ben's mother. Ben knew what the man was after and urged him to stop his actions immediately. Before the man could refuse, the siren song suddenly began to play outside. Drawn by the sound, the bald henchman followed it into the wilderness, where he stumbled into a trap set by Rin and her sister. As he was nearly strangled to death, the bald henchman revealed that a military fishing vessel was set to deploy bait that night and catch all the mermaids in one go. He claimed that he was the only one who could call back the fishing vessel and halt the operation. But when he tried to make the call, the commander on the other end said the operation had already begun. Rin wanted to kill the bald henchman, but Ben stopped her. As a predator, she couldn't understand why Ben would help someone who had harmed them. She felt betrayed by Ben and left with her sister. At this point, Donna was severely dehydrated and needed to return to the sea immediately. The transformation scene, where she falls into the water and becomes a mermaid, was coincidentally witnessed by the fisherman Xander, who displayed a greedy expression. He planned to head out to sea that very night to hunt and called on Ben to join him. Having witnessed the mermaid's transformation, Xander's long-held belief in the existence of mermaids was finally validated. He decided to call a few friends to join him in a night hunt at sea. Ben was just pondering how to rescue the mermaids caught by the military fishing vessel when he saw an opportunity. He persuaded Xander that instead of searching aimlessly in the Great Sea, it would be easier to catch mermaids by following the military fishing vessel. Xander found the idea reasonable, so he secretly took his father's fishing boat out to sea. To his surprise, his father had been sleeping on the boat like a snoring pig and was inadvertently brought along. The father awoke and went to challenge his son. Ben quickly stepped in front of Xander to defend his actions, but the man thought these youngsters were recklessly playing with their lives and commanded him to step aside. The old captain turned the boat around. Ben told him that a boat dispatched by the military was causing trouble in his fishing grounds. He could either pretend not to see it like everyone else, or choose to do something and set an example for his son. The man glanced at him and then changed the boat's course, and so the boat headed towards the coordinates of the military fishing vessel. They sailed across the dark sea, where thick fog reduced visibility. Suddenly, a fishing vessel appeared ahead, and they were about to collide. Ben hastily adjusted the direction, but it was too close, and they still crashed into each other. This vessel turned out to be the one sent by the military to lure mermaids. But more horrifyingly, there were no lights on the other boat, and it seemed deserted, like a ghost ship. Driven by curiosity, the group decided to investigate and armed themselves before boarding the vessel. Incredibly, they found it completely empty, with only bloodstains scattered across the deck. They couldn't help but wonder where everyone had gone. They continued to explore the ship, which seemed to have recently been the site of a horrific event. The coffee in the rest area was still hot, the cages intended for catching mermaids were empty, and next to a dragged bloodstain on the floor lay a military gun. Everyone had vanished, until Chris discovered a long, bloodied bone spear. At this moment, Ben noticed some disturbance on the water's surface, realizing that something was terribly wrong. He quickly called his companions to rush back to their fishing boat. As fishermen, they had never seen such a scene. For their safety, the old captain decided to return immediately. However, Xander argued with his father because he thought it was a rare opportunity and they couldn't go back empty-handed. He insisted on catching a mermaid, believing that it would lead to prosperity. The old captain felt a strong sense of responsibility and could not let his crew be endangered. Unexpectedly, the fishing boat hadn't gone far when it suddenly malfunctioned. They all grabbed their weapons on high alert. The captain and Xander prepared to check the engine while Ben and two others kept watch on deck. Unbeknownst to them, they were already surrounded. Suddenly, a bone spear flew out of the water, startling Chris, who fell to the ground. More bone spears kept shooting out from the sea, forcing them to take cover by lying down. At that moment, Xander tried to restart the battery when a bone spear pierced through the side of the boat, allowing seawater to gush in. After dodging the bone spear attack, they took the opportunity to shoot into the water with their weapons. The next second, a huge figure leaped onto the fishing boat, making Ben retreat in fear. The fishing boat, which came to hunt mermaids, faced an attack from an unknown creature. 
A brutal and bloodthirsty mermaid stood on its tail and advanced towards Ben. Ben kept retreating as they hurriedly reloaded their harpoons. The male mermaid raised a large bone hammer to strike at Ben, who fortunately dodged it. His companion fired a shot, which the mermaid quickly dodged. As it prepared to strike at Ben again, Xander arrived with a harpoon gun, and the mermaid seemed to be hurt, judging by its reaction. So they fired another shot, and the mermaid dived directly into the cabin. Xander told the other two to keep watch on the deck while he and Ben went to subdue it. Going below, they cautiously moved forward. They had only ever seen female mermaids and hadn't anticipated the male mermaid's fighting strength. The mermaid suddenly attacked from behind, but Ben quickly dodged, evading a barrage of attacks. Hearing the commotion, Xander arrived and fired the harpoon gun. This time it hit, and together they managed to push the mermaid into the storeroom and locked the door. Meanwhile, the other two on deck were watching the water when Chris heard singing from behind. It was Donna singing the siren song, and Chris was enchanted, involuntarily dropping his harpoon as his companion called out to him. But all he could hear was the song, and just as he was about to take Donna's hand, his companion picked up a flare gun and fired. The flare startled Donna, and Ben arrived in time to pull Chris back from enchantment. At that moment, Donna held a bone spear and approached menacingly. Even the flare shot by his companion did not deter her. Her eyes were filled with hatred, wanting to avenge all humans. At the critical moment, Ben used a fishing net to knock her back into the water, and Chris regained his consciousness. With the crisis averted and the captain having repaired the short-circuited wires, they were ready to return. However, they still needed to repair the leak that had occurred. Xander was swaggering about their recent catch, the male mermaid. When he and Ben went to check the cabin, they noticed from afar that the heavy iron door of the secret chamber had been forcefully broken open. Cautiously, Ben took an axe from the wall and peered inside. All that was left was a discarded fishtail. The mermaid, now in human form, had appeared in the control room. The old captain had just turned around when he was fatally wounded. With his dying breath, he called out to his son, Xander. Hearing the call, the crew rushed to the scene. The old captain pointed towards the door, and Xander gave chase, firing his gun. It seemed those weapons were only good for close combat. Whether it was the range or something else, not a single shot hit its mark. The mermaid escaped by leaping into the sea. At this time, the captain was on his last breath. Knowing his end was near, he told his son that his harshness had been to prepare him to take over as captain, and now the Tesla fishing boat was his. With those final words, he closed his eyes forever. Watching his father's tragic death filled Xander with remorse. He blamed his own stubborn pursuit of the mermaid for leading to his father's demise. As the captain had been killed by a legendary deep-sea creature, Xander could only throw his father's body into the ocean. They couldn't explain the true cause of his death to the world. No one would believe the truth, and it would seem like the crew had murdered him. For the greater good, Ben fabricated a story, claiming the old captain had accidentally tripped over a fishing net and drowned. Despite their grief, they knew they couldn't bring his body back. The crew lifted the old captain's remains and walked to the side of the boat. Xander, holding back tears, personally committed his father's body to the depths. His heart was heavy with guilt. If only he hadn't stolen his father's fishing boat to chase after mermaids, his father might not have met such a fate. Elsewhere, Rin was about to dive into the water when the police arrested her for previously killing the dirty man. At the moment of her arrest, Rin couldn't understand why she was being apprehended. In a desperate act of defiance, she roared like a goose in resistance. Once she had calmed down, the sheriff began the interrogation. Recognizing the sheriff as Maddie's father and knowing he meant no harm, she cooperated. The sheriff showed her a photo of the dead man who wanted to play dirty on her and asked if she was responsible for the deed. Rin didn't hide the truth and admitted to it. Seeing the frail girl before him, the sheriff could hardly believe she had managed to shove a 200-pound man through a car window. He suspected there had to be an accomplice. Misunderstanding his implication, Rin innocently said that Maddie and Ben had been helping her all along. The sheriff was baffled, unable to believe that his own daughter was involved in a homicide. To uncover the truth, he quickly called Maddie in for questioning. Having spent a lot of time with Rin, Maddie knew how to communicate effectively. Rin explained that the man had taken her to a remote area and began to harass her. The sheriff concluded it was self-defense. Still, he found it hard to believe such a small girl could possess such strength. Since Maddie had a promise with her father to never lie or conceal the truth, she revealed everything to him, hoping he could help them. She asked him to bring seawater, and when it was poured over Rin's hands, she painfully began to transform, revealing her true nature. The shock on the sheriff's face said it all. He finally understood why Rin had such incredible strength. She was not human. As a result, Rin was subsequently released without charge.
On the other side, the military had retrieved the fishing vessel, but not a single person was found aboard. The deck was smeared with blood and not even a body was found. The military had completely underestimated the mermaid's capabilities. Elsewhere, Donna had told Rin that she had killed everyone on the military fishing vessel. After a falling out with her sister over differing opinions, Rin prepared to attend the old captain's funeral upon the return of the fishing boat. She found it odd to see everyone dressed in dark clothes, and Maddie explained that it was customary to wear such attire to show respect when someone has passed away. At that moment, Ben unleashed his pent-up anger on Rin, accusing her that her sister is a bloodthirsty predator. At the memorial gathering for the old captain, Xander, racked with guilt over his father's death, nearly lost control and blurted out the truth. Realizing the potential slip-up, Ben immediately stepped forward to stop him. Some questioned how the seafaring captain could have been dragged underwater by a fishing net, finding it hard to believe. But despite their suspicions, the captain's own son claimed it was the net that took him, which dispersed their suspicions. Rin, feeling guilty about her people's attack and the killing of the old captain, donned black attire and approached Xander to apologize. However, Rin did not realize that this simple apology would change the fate of her entire tribe. After speaking, she turned and walked away. Just as Xander was about to seek clarification from Rin, Ben blocked his path. When Xander learned that Ben had been keeping such a big secret from him, he was furious. Despite having witnessed his father's death at the hands of a mermaid, his friend still claimed to protect the mermaid, which he found difficult to accept. In a fit of anger, he slammed his fist against a metal cabinet to vent his emotions and sought solace in alcohol. Maddie, worried that Xander might seek revenge on Rin, decided to keep an eye on him, but all he wanted was to sleep on the fishing boat, his father's legacy, a place filled with his father's smelly scent and memories. Lying in the bed where his father had once slept, he asked Maddie why she wanted to protect the mermaid. Maddie told him that she believed Rin is kind-hearted and she's special. Xander then couldn't help but touch Maddie's face, indicating that they were each other's exes. Turning to Rin, because Ben's hurtful remark calling her an animal, she left disheartened the entire day. She went back to the Marine Research Center and was greeted by the barking of sea lions. As she approached, the sea lion happily leaped up to greet her, no longer growling at her sight. This transformation comforted Rin. She squatted down and gently stroked the sea lion, which nestled against her shoulder. The sea lion's trust brought joy to the previously saddened Rin. When Ben returned and witnessed this display of kindness, he was struck with remorse for having taken his anger out on her. It was her people who had committed the crime, yet he had directed his anger at her. He wanted to hear Rin sing, unaware that the mermaid's singing held an extraordinary enchantment. Ben was completely captivated by her voice, oblivious to the fact that more mermaids had already come ashore. Donna arrived on land with two of her kin, intending to take her sister Rin back to the sea, who she believed was bewitched by the human world. They went to Helen's grocery store to inquire about Rin's whereabouts. Helen knew that the mermaid world was rife with schemes. Their pursuit of Rin wasn't just about taking her back. When Helen refused to divulge information, at the command of the mermaid, the male mermaid grasped Helen's neck and pinned her heavy body against the wall. Despite the threat from the fierce mermaids, Helen wouldn't reveal Rin's location. They didn't kill her because she was also a mermaid and left straight away. Helen, still shaken, took a deep breath and shakily dialed Ben's number on her phone. Rin knew that her sister had brought hunters from their clan, powerful beings from the deep sea who wouldn't rest until their goal was achieved. Rin didn't want to see her friends harmed, deciding to return to the sea with her sister. Thus, Rin brought Ben to the Marine Research Center, knowing that her sister would come looking for her there. Rin found Donna and bowed her head to her sister in submission, saying she would return with her. But at that moment, the mermaid hunters revealed their intent to kill Rin, which was their real purpose for coming. Donna, apparently uninformed, immediately stepped in front to protect her sister from harm. Ben instructed the mermaid sisters to duck down, and he doused them with a bucket of seawater, seizing the opportunity to escape. The two mermaid hunters began to mutate upon contact with the seawater, letting out agonizing screams. Ben drove the sisters away from the scene. The seawater had also splashed on Donna's wrist, and Rin used the method taught by Helen to alleviate the pain. Donna didn't want to harm her sister, but the danger she had brought upon Rin filled her with remorse. Now, Ben and everyone else wondered why the mermaids had to kill Rin. Rin revealed that it's all because she had stayed too long with humans. She added that long ago, a mermaid stayed with humans for an extended period, fell in love, and had a child together. 
But the offspring was born deformed, and the man, believing it to be a curse from the heavens, killed his own child. The grieving mermaid returned to the deep sea which enraged the man. He then led many fishermen to hunt mermaids, leading to their near extinction. Ben was shocked by the story. He knew this historical tale was real, and that man was actually his grandfather. It was for this reason that the mermaid clan feared the tragedy would recur, so they sent people to eliminate Rin. The police station received a report that three individuals claimed they were robbed of their clothes by three naked people at the beach. Maddie exchanged a knowing look with her father. Under normal circumstances, this would be treated as a regular robbery. However, the sheriff knew what was really happening. It was the three mermaids coming ashore, and he prepared to launch a capture operation. Meanwhile, Xander, unwilling to let his father die so tragically, went home to retrieve his gun, determined to avenge his father's death. Instead, he encountered Rin and Donna, who were hiding from their pursuers. When he took a closer look at Donna following behind, he felt she looked familiar, as if he had seen her somewhere before. She had been on the boat the night his father was murdered, so he raised his gun at her, assuming she was with the mermaids who killed his father. Rin argued that since they had a common enemy, they could join forces to fight against the mermaids pursuing them. After all, the enemy was strong and there was strength in numbers. Xander liked the idea and was eager to act immediately. Meanwhile, the patrol team arranged by the sheriff continued their vigilant patrols into the night amidst heavy fog and low visibility. The sheriff drove slowly, carefully surveying the surroundings, not wanting to miss anything. Suddenly, two figures appeared and blocked his path. He immediately stopped, and with his decades of experience, he recognized that these were the mermaids they were looking for. He called for backup and was about to sound the siren when it angered the mermaid hunters. They jumped onto the hood of his car, and the leading mermaid approached him. One of them punched through the car window and grabbed the sheriff, but the sheriff wouldn't be manhandled so easily. He grabbed his pistol and fired two shots at the leading mermaid, probably missing, as the noise scared them off. The sheriff then sounded the siren and chased after them in his car. The mermaid hunters, frightened by the siren, ran even faster, but they couldn't outrun the police car. The sheriff caught up and rammed into them, knocking one into a trash can, where they fell unconscious. When backup arrived, the sheriff cautiously approached, and after confirming they were no longer a threat, he handcuffed and detained the unconscious hunter in the car, then reassured his worried daughter. But soon, the hunter awoke, looking around nervously, and began headbutting the security mesh. The sheriff warned him not to make any rash moves, but the hunter continued, eventually breaking the mesh and causing the police car to lose balance and crash into a roadside vehicle. The sheriff, regaining consciousness, realized the hunter had escaped and called for backup. Now, Maddie, aware of the danger her father faced, could no longer sit still. Not far away, Rin was making a mermaid's call. Several others sat by, waiting for a bite. The leading mermaid approached directly. Rin gestured to her for a truce, but the mermaid wasn't buying it. Just as they were about to come to blows, the leading mermaid spotted Xander holding a shotgun. She grabbed Rin and used her as a shield, quickly moving to escape. The rest of the group gave chase. The mermaid dragged Rin into a warehouse where a struggle ensued. Ben moved to help, but was pushed away by the mermaid with one swift move. Donna came up from behind and tried to choke the mermaid, who responded with a sharp elbow to the stomach and overpowered Donna, knocking her to the ground. Ben swung his stick and missed, while the mermaid quickly picked up a scythe, forcing both to retreat continuously. Meanwhile, Xander arrived with his gun, only to see the mermaid hunters also on the scene. Recognizing them as his father's killers, he was seething with rage, but he was taken down by the hunters before he could react. The agile Rin picked up a boat anchor and threw it at the hunters. Xander took the opportunity to fire a shot but missed, even at close range. It seemed that the mermaid tribe was particularly afraid of any loud noises, and they took off running once again. Rin and the others gave chase directly. The two ran into Helen's grocery store and grabbed a few long spears, which looked quite heavy. At this time, Ben and two others were searching for them on the street when a spear flew past, nearly skewering them. The sisters didn't hesitate and chased after them, while Ben hid behind a car, stealing glances. When he turned back, they were gone. Clearly, he was of no help and was just holding them back. Rin and her sister followed the scent to the seaport by the beach. While Rin was searching separately from Donna, the leading mermaid suddenly appeared, pushed Rin, slapped her hard, and pushed her again. 
Rin tried to retaliate but was blocked by her, who then hit her hard with her hand, followed by another slap. Before Rin could react, the leading mermaid forcefully pushed her to the ground. Rin got up and returned a hard slap to her, stunning her. She was subdued by Rin in a hold, pressing her hand to the ground. Rin mounted the mermaid and began to slap her fiercely. Unable to endure, the mermaid gestured for surrender and Rin finally stopped. Rin had thoroughly conquered the leading mermaid hunter. Elsewhere, the sheriff, still searching the streets, encountered his daughter coming to support him. At that moment, the mermaid hunters appeared. Seeing that they were armed, the father and daughter took cover behind the car. The sheriff used the rearview mirror to spot the hunters. As the hunters threw their spears, the sheriff took his chance and fired several shots, none hitting the target. Another spear was thrown, and to the sheriff's surprise, it pierced through the car body and struck his leg. Maddie took the gun from his hand and fired at the hunter, driving him away. Hearing the gunshots, Ben came to help the sheriff up and took him home. The sheriff asked his daughter to call the police right away to stop them before they could harm more people. But Ben didn't want to expose Rin's identity and stopped her from calling. The situation was now out of control and Maddie was extremely disappointed with Ben's actions, realizing he was bewitched, only caring about Rin and disregarding the safety of others. What she didn't know was that the siren song had completely robbed Ben of his judgment. Ben picked up the gun and left. Maddie asked him where he was going, and Ben said he was going to help Rin. At that moment, Ben encountered the mermaid hunters. When he tried to shoot at them, he shockingly discovered that his gun was out of bullets. With no other choice, he used the butt of the gun to knock the weapon from the hunter's hand. But when he tried to strike the hunter with force, his blow was blocked. The hunter then lifted Ben and threw him into the distance. As the hunter raised his spear to stab Ben, Rin and Donna appeared with the leading mermaid. It turns out that the mermaid tribe is a matriarchal society and this subdued mermaid was their leader. By defeating the leader, Rin would become the new head of the tribe. They thought the battle was over at that point. Unexpectedly, Xander arrived with his gun aiming at the mermaid hunters, determined to avenge his father's death. Despite Ben's attempts to dissuade him, Xander insisted on firing. Ben lunged forward and tragically, the bullet hit and killed Donna, which shocked everyone. As a result, Xander was arrested for the killing, but he was not relieved by killing the mermaid. Instead, he fell into deep remorse. Since the mermaid community in the ocean does not accept mermaids who die in human form, Helen took Rin and the others to a mysterious island. Here, many mermaids who died in human form are buried. Helen revealed to them that the deformed child from the mermaid stories was not killed. The child was still in a transformation phase at birth and just looked deformed. An ignorant doctor, considering her a monster, refused treatment, so Ben's grandfather took the child to the woods and handed her over to the Haida tribe, who were not afraid of shapeshifters. She survived and thrived, and both Helen and Ben descended from her. Helen told Ben that she and Ben are blood-related and suggested the shocking Ben to ask his family for the truth. Rin eventually decided to leave her dead sister on the island. However, the police delivered the terrible news. The bald henchman, not having heard the siren song for a long time, was discovered drowned by the seaside. Rin realized something terrible because she had also sung to Ben. At that moment, Ben was at the sea, trying to clear his mind alone. Suddenly, he heard the siren's song underwater and desperately swam downwards, becoming satiated with water. In the nick of time, Rin, transformed into a mermaid, arrived and dragged him back to the boat. The sheriff was also having a tough time. With the recent series of murders and shootings lacking any reasonable explanation, the town council decided to relieve him of his duties. Maddie could no longer tolerate Ben, who seemed to have only Rin on his mind, and she suggested they separate. Rin felt responsible for putting Ben in danger, and thus said goodbye to him. She decided to leave this place of heartache and start a new life. And with that, the first season came to an end.